Well, good morning to you. If you've got your Bible with you this morning, I invite you to open up to John chapter 1. John chapter 1, that is where we're going to find a beginning place for our study together this morning. Be opening up there if you would. Thank you so much for your presence this morning. We have those of our number, as Brother Mitch mentioned, that are back with us. We're thankful for that. We've got some of our number who are still out, and certainly we want to remain in prayer for them and be hopeful for their return and look on them and see if there's any way that we might be of service. But for those of you who are here this morning, certainly thank you. And for those of you who are joining us electronically, we're thankful for your interest in spiritual things. We simply want to ask a very fundamental question this morning, and it is this. Did Jesus exist? And that is really the only thing that we want to look at this morning. And perhaps it is some in the audience are thinking, well, yeah, and so let's pack up the Bible, pull out the songbook really loudly, and get the song leader queued up, and let's go home. But perhaps you have seen that generations change, and societies change. Where once in our society it was taken for granted that people believed in Jesus and accepted that he lived, the reality is that is a fundamental question that many have to face today. Did Jesus exist? And there are a variety of answers to this question. And so what we want to spend our time doing this morning is trying to answer this question. Let's begin by setting the stage for our discussion. Hopefully you're there with me in John chapter 1. And in verse 1 we see that Scripture affirms to us the existence of Jesus. That is, if we are prone to accept the Bible as being the Word of God, then Scripture would reveal to those who believe it that Jesus did exist. Scripture talks about, for example, the pre-existence of Jesus. Beginning in verse 1, in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. All things came into being through Him, and apart from Him, nothing came into being that has come into being. Uh, if you skip down with me to verse 14, we find out that that Word, who is simply referred to as Word in verses 1 through 3, that Word became flesh. And dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. That phrase there in verse 14, the only begotten of the Father, if perhaps we know any verse in our Bibles, it might be John 3 and verse 16, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. That actually is a callback here to John chapter 1 and verse 14 where Jesus is introduced to us as the Word, the only begotten of the Father. But here Scripture affirms for us, speaking of Jesus as the Word, His preexistence, that before He was born in Bethlehem, Jesus existed. He existed with God in heaven from the beginning. We saw, verse 14, that that word became flesh and dwelt among us. Uh, the fancy word for that is the incarnation. Jesus came in flesh. But it's not simply the incarnation, but the reality that that incarnation was divine. That he came from heaven as God's son. He himself being God coming in human form. The idea that Jesus came in flesh isn't so much of a challenge. But as we read in chapter 6 and verse 38, for instance, we find out that truly Jesus was and is divine. He said this, I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. I have come down from heaven. You put that together with a passage like John chapter 8 and verse 58, where Jesus would say that before Abraham was, I am and he uses that phrase, I am, a callback to Exodus chapter 3 and the story of Moses coming before the burning bush and asking God who it is that he's supposed to say uh, 
uh, has sent him when he comes before his people, the Hebrews, and Moses was to say, I am has sent me. Jesus here, uh, to a Jewish audience, unquestionably affirmed the reality that he was divine, that he was God. And so we have God in the flesh. Indeed, Matthew chapter 1, you shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. Scripture affirms the pre-existence of Jesus, the divine incarnation of Jesus. Scripture affirms the atoning death of Jesus. There in John chapter 3, in verses 14 and 15, Even as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so also must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Here is the Son of Man who was going to be lifted up for the salvation of mankind. And then Scripture would affirm to us the reality of the resurrection of Jesus. In John chapter 20, in verses 16 and 17, Jesus has raised from the dead, and he said to her, Mary. And she turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabbani, which means teacher. And Jesus said to her, Stop clinging to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brethren and say to them, I ascend to my Father and your Father and to my God and your God. Jesus affirms not only that he had rose from the dead, but he affirms that he would then ascend to the Father. Now very briefly, that's the testimony of Scripture. But perhaps one of the failings that we might encounter as Christians is when we seek to talk to our more skeptical friends and we attempt to use the Bible to prove the Bible. Talking to our friends who might be more atheistic, who might be more agnostic, who might be more skeptical, saying, well, Jesus says that he existed, and so Jesus existed because he said he existed because he existed because he said he existed. That's that circular reasoning that we come to hate in logic classes, isn't it? And so to some it might be that, well, the Bible is not sufficient testimony. It's a witness that has skin in the game, and therefore its witness is to be dismissed, and we need more solid proof. We need something more verifiable. And so the question is, is there more evidence than Scripture? Because not everyone regards Scripture as being inspired. Not everyone looks at the Bible and, and sees the Bible as being the Word of God that is communicated to men and women. Some people see the Bible as just a c collection of good sayings and, and, and wisdom uh, that we ought to put into use in practical life, but really it's no more inspired than, say, the Red Badge of Courage or Jane Eyre. Others would say the Bible is just completely false, that it's the product of men and women who have sought to control and dominate the lives of people, and really it is fit for nothing more than the garbage dump of history. Now, we're not going to cover all of that this morning, but we're going to hone in on this one question. Was Jesus a myth? Or did Jesus actually exist? And this is a legitimate question. A man who on YouTube goes by the name of the godless engineer had this to say in his YouTube video, Six Reasons You Should Not Believe in Jesus, uh, quoting, like I said, though, nobody outside the New Testament attests to a historical Jesus. That's a bold claim. Nobody outside the New Testament attests to a historical Jesus. So here's the gauntlet thrown down. Did Jesus exist? And as Christians, and as much as it cringes me to say this as a preacher of the gospel, we're going to set our Bibles aside for a few moments this morning. Now, we're going to come back to them in a little while, but we're going to set them aside for a few moments this morning, and we're going to ask this question. Can secular history prove to us that Jesus existed? Is there evidence that Jesus existed? But before we jump headlong into that, I want us to ask this question. Because this is an important question. And it's a question that is oftentimes unfairly dismissed. 
Is it fair to dismiss the testimony of Scripture? I don't believe the Bible is inspired. Very well, I'll grant that. You may not believe that the Bible is inspired. Does that mean that we discount the entirety of the Bible? Or can the Bible be accepted as a historical document? Here's what I mean by that. When you step back and look at the facts, th th this is not Christian wishing. This is not pandering. These are facts. Facts that we can go to museums and look at. Facts that we can document. The reality is the Bible is the most well-documented work of antiquity. When you're talking about books and history and recorded writings and readings, the Bible is the most well-documented book of antiquity. Uh, the Bible comes to us on the basis, the, the Bibles that you and I hold in our hands today, come to us on the basis of more than 25,000 manuscripts. Sometimes you see MSS in your Bibles. When you're looking at a marginal reference or something, that just means manuscripts. It's a whole lot easier than writing out the whole long word, and that's what I did up here too. MSS just means manuscripts. Twenty-five, over 25,000 manuscripts and manuscript fragments serve as the basis of the Bible that you and I read today. Is that a lot? Is that not too much? Well, think about this as well. The closest manuscript that we have today, it's called an extant manuscript. The closest extant manuscript that we have today to the autographs, and when we're talking about an autograph, we're not talking about a signature on a baseball card. We're talking about the original document. So, for example, the original letter that was written by Paul to the Ephesians, right? Right? the original copy of Mark's gospel account. To our knowledge, we're not in possession of any of the autographs. But we have copies of copies and things like that. And the closest manuscript that is extant, that is existing today, brings us to within 80 years of the autograph. That is, someone could have been alive and had access to the autograph and copied it verbatim, and we have that in existence today. It's called the John Rylands Papyrus. You can look that up sometime if you want to. Facts and figures don't mean anything without some sort of comparison, though. Think about this with me. Did you ever have to read or reference the Gaelic Wars by Caesar when you were in high school or college? Caesar's Gaelic Wars that we read in our history classes comes to us on the basis of a sum total of 10 manuscript copies. And those, the earliest of those manuscripts are separated from the autograph by 900 years. 10 manuscripts, 900 years separated from the autograph. Or Herodotus, the father of history, quotes such as, in peace sons bury their fathers, in war fathers bury their sons. That's Herodotus. Or of all men's miseries, the bitterest is this, to know so much and have control over nothing. If you've heard those before, that's Herodotus. The father of history, noted for his work entitled Histories, comes to us on the basis of 109 manuscript copies, the closest of which to the autograph is 1,300 years separated. Now I say all of that and put all that information out to get us to this question. When you were in Western Civ, when you were in world history, when you were in literature class, and you had to reference the Gaelic Wars, or you had to reference Herodotus, 
when you opened up that big tome of a literature book that you had to lug around in your backpack and probably gave you scoliosis. When you opened that up and read those pages in that book, what were you reading? What did your professor or your teacher tell you you were reading? You were reading the words of Caesar, right? You were reading the words of Herodotus. You were reading histories. You were reading the Gaelic Wars. And I have no problem with that. I've got no problem saying that when you're reading histories by Herodotus, you're reading just exactly what Herodotus wrote. I have no problem at all with admitting that. But can we apply the same standard? I'm not asking for a different standard. I'm not asking that we lower the bar for Christianity so that we can kind of just step over it and ta-da, we've proven our point. I'm just asking for consistency. Can we apply the same standard to Christianity? If we're saying when we read the words of Herodotus and histories, we're reading what Herodotus legitimately wrote. If we're saying that what we're reading in the Gaelic Wars is legitimately what Caesar communicated, then can we say when we come to the New Testament, when we come to the Bible, on the basis of 25,000 manuscripts, some of which are within 80 years of the autograph, can we just apply the same standard and say that, yes, we can accept Scripture? Even if we're not going to accept it as divinely inspired, can we simply agree that it passes the test as a historical document? And if we're going to say no, on what basis are we going to say no? And then upon that basis, are we ready to go to the world literature books and the Western Civ books and start tearing pages out of books? Consistency is a booger sometimes, isn't it? But we've got to be consistent. Now, we've said that. Let's get to our question. Did Jesus exist? Let's turn first to the words of Tacitus in his work entitled Annals. In the 2nd century A.D. 2nd century A.D. Okay, so 100 to 199 A.D. And here's what Tacitus wrote in Annals. He said, Nero fastened the guilt and inflicted the most exquisite tortures on a class hated for their abominations, called Christians by the populace. Christus, from whom the name had its origin, suffered the extreme penalty during the reign of Tiberius at the hands of one of our procurators, Pontius Pilatus. And a most mischievous superstition, thus checked for the moment, again broke out not only in Judea, but uh, the source, uh, the first source of the evil, but then even in Rome. Christians, he references, but not only Christians, he references Christ. It's a corruption of the name there. Christus, Christ, who suffered it and notice this isn't this isn't put forward as a question. This is accepted fact in the second century. Some one hundred years removed, possibly even less than that, from when Jesus literally walked the earth. That this Christus, this Jesus, suffered the extreme penalty, that sounds like death to me, during the reign of Tiberius at the hands of Pontius Pilatus. Does that sound a whole lot like Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John right there? But it's not Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, is it? It's Tacitus, 2nd century A.D. How about this? Not everybody has a really pretty bust in museums. And so you get Lucian. Kind kind of an awkward looking fella. They might say the same thing about me though. Here's what Lucian of Samosata had to say in his work, The Passing of Peregrinus in the 2nd century A.D. 
Lucian would say the poor wretches have convinced themselves, first and foremost, that they are going to be immortal and live for all time, in consequence of which they despise death and even willingly give themselves into its custody. Most of them. Furthermore, their first lawgiver persuaded them that they are all brothers of one another after they have transgressed once for all by denying the Greek gods and by worshiping that crucified sophist himself and living under his laws. Now, obviously, we've got somebody here that he's writing about that has a slant against Christianity. That's fine and well. In the courtroom, we might call this a hostile witness. But the testimony of a hostile witness sure can be important. And he affirms here about this crucified one being a lawgiver and bringing brothers and sisters together. And the expectation of immortality and the refusal to be fearful of death. That sounds really familiar, doesn't it? Or how about Josephus, Flavius Josephus, in his Antiquities of the Jews, written about A.D. 95, Josephus would say this. Now there was about this time Jesus, a wise man, if it be lawful to call him a man, for he was a doer of wonderful works, a teacher of such men as received the truth with pleasure. He drew over to him both many of the Jews and many of the Gentiles. He was the Christ. And when Pilate, at the suggestion of the principal men amongst us, had condemned him to the cross, those that loved him at the first did not forsake him, for he appeared to them alive again the third day. As the divine prophets had foretold these and 10,000 other wonderful things concerning him, and the tribe of Christians so named from him are not extinct to this day. A.D. 95. 60 years, perhaps, after the crucifixion? Jesus drew over many of the Jews, many of the Gentiles. Look, cross it out. If you don't want to accept that Jesus was the Christ, or we think that's weighted terminology, strike it from the record. We'll just ignore it. And when Pilate, at the suggestion of the principal men among us, had condemned him to the cross, those that loved Pilate... Condemned whom to the cross? This isn't Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. This isn't Peter, Paul, James, or Jude. This isn't even a Christian. Josephus. Josephus would affirm that Jesus existed, that he existed in the time of Pilate, and that he was put to death. Josephus will also affirm that he arose from the dead. Just like Scripture, Josephus, coming from a Jewish background, just like the Scriptures, had prophesied. Uh, Keep going. He says a little bit more in the Antiquities of the Jews, does Josephus. A different reference here. Uh, This is in his Antiquities. This is uh, in the 20th section. And if you want to call it paragraph 9 or verse 9. Ananus was of this disposition. He thought he had now a proper opportunity to exercise his authority. Festus was now dead. And Albinus was but upon the road. And so he, Ananus, assembled the Sanhedrin of Judges and brought before them the brother of Jesus who was called Christ, whose name was James. James, the brother of Jesus. One of these little facts that's just mentioned offhand in Scripture. But here the historian Josephus records it. He's not quoting Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. He's simply recording history. And some others or some of his companions, and when he had formed an accusation against them as law breakers or breakers of the law, he delivered them to be stoned. Josephus would affirm that Jesus existed. Here's a father who wrote a letter to his son. And it's called the Mara ben Serapion letter, dated to the late first century A.D., so perhaps around the same time as 
Josephus is writing. And here's what, or rather here's an excerpt from the letter. What benefit did the Athenians obtain by putting Socrates to death? Socrates lived from 470 to about 400 B.C. Seeing that they received his retribution for it, famine and pestilence. Or the people of Samos by the burning of Pythagoras, 570 to about 500 B.C. Or the Jews by the murder of their very wise king seeing that from that time, that very time, their kingdom was driven away from them. For with justice did God grant a recompense to the wisdom of all three men, for the Athenians died by famine, and the people of Samos were covered by the sea without remedy, and the Jews, brought to desolation and expelled from their kingdom, are driven away into every land. Matthew 24, Matthew 25, what was going to happen to Jerusalem and to the nation of Israel because of their rejectance of the rejection of the Messiah. Judgment was coming upon that nation. Jesus offered them, have I, have I not uh, extended my hands to you and, and gathered you together as a hen would gather her chicks under her wings, but you were unwilling. See that your house is left to you desolate. And in A.D. 70, what happened to the city of Jerusalem and the Jewish nation? It was raised by the Roman armies. Seems to be just exactly what Mara bin Serapion's letter is talking about here. The wise king on whose death occasioned the destruction of the nation Seems to be Jesus, doesn't it? Further in the letter. Nay, Socrates did not die because of Plato, nor yet Pythagoras because of the statue of Hera, nor yet the wise king because of, of the new laws that he enacted. Or origin as he's quoting Phlegon in his work against Celsus in A.D. 250. Everybody wants to do the little point that he's doing right now, so take a moment, do the origin point. Here's what he said. Now, Phlegon, in the 13th or 14th book, I think, of his Chronicles, not only ascribed to Jesus a knowledge of future events, although falling into confusion about some things which refer to Peter as if they referred to Jesus, but also testified that the result corresponded to his prediction, so that he also, by these very admissions regarding foreknowledge, as if against his will, expressed his opinion that the doctrines taught by the fathers of our system were not devoid of divine power. Focus simply on what he says there, Phlegon, in his Chronicles, a work that is now largely uh, lost. But Origen quotes it, as do some other writers, ascribed to Jesus a knowledge of future events. And this connection with whom? With Peter. Uh, going on here in chapter 33 of Against Celsus. But if Celsus believed the gospel accounts when he thinks that he can find in them the matter of charge against the Christians and refuse to believe them when they establish the divinity of Jesus, our answer to him is this, Sir, either disbelieve all the gospel narratives and then no longer imagine that you can, uh, that you can found charges upon them, or in yielding your belief to their statements, look in admiration on the Logos of God, who became incarnate, who desired to confer benefits upon the whole race of humanity. The, the, the argument that is made here is just one that, that we have already referenced in a different set of words earlier in our study. We've either got to accept the, the entirety of Scripture or we've got to reject the entirety of Scripture. There, there, there's no splitting the middle here. There's no taking two steps across the gap. 
We accept Jesus or reject Jesus. We accept the, the Bible or reject the Bible. But we cannot, but this is what so many do, we cannot alternately, for our own whims and purposes, alternately accept and reject bits and pieces of the gospel and bits and pieces of the Bible. Is it a historical work or not? Is it the inspired word of God or not? Again in chapter 33, and with regard to the eclipse, in the time of Tiberius Caesar, in whose reign Jesus appears to have been crucified. Notice just the simple statement of fact. Jesus crucified when? The reign of Tiberius Caesar. Earthquakes that took place. And the eclipse that took place. Darkness from, what was it, the sixth hour until the ninth hour? Rather than recorded history upending the story of Scripture, rather we see recorded history affirming even the minute details that the New Testament writers would lay out for us. Julius Africanus, quoting a man named Thallus in a work entitled Chronology, dating from about A.D. 220, said this, On the whole world there pressed a most fearful darkness, and the rocks were rent by an earthquake, and many places in Judea and other districts were thrown down. This darkness, Thallus, in his third book of his history, calls, as appears to me without reason, an eclipse of the sun. Uh, give Julius Africanus some credit here. He knows a whole lot more about eclipses than I do, so I had to go back and do some research and some study on this. Based on the Jewish calendar and when Passover would fall based upon the lunar cycles, you could not have a solar eclipse during the time of Passover when Jesus was crucified. It's a universal impossibility. And that's what Africanus is saying here. He says, Thallus calls it an eclipse of the sun, and maybe just from observation and being perplexed by it, that's what you would come up with. But Julius Africanus would say, it was a darkness induced by God because the Lord happened then to suffer. He says, science says it cannot have been an eclipse. It had to be something more. It had to be something from the hand of God. But this isn't Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. These are outside sources, outside references, historical references. Now, we're not going to delve in too much more to this. I hope that's enough to perhaps lay before us the case that history does attest to the historical Jesus. Somebody might say, though, well, why do we not have a more robust historical record of Jesus? If he is supposed to be the God-man who changed so much of this world, why don't we have a deeper, closer, chronologically speaking, account of him? I think R.T. France, a New Testament scholar, answers this well when he said, from the point of view of Roman history, of the first century, Jesus was a nobody. A man of no social standing who achieved brief local notice in a remote and little-loved province as a preacher and miracle worker and who was duly executed by order of a minor provincial governor. This could hardly be expected to achieve mention in the Roman headlines. Look, we can read the San Antonio paper and you know what you're not going to read about? You're not going to read about what happened in Gladewater, Texas last night. Because Gladewater, Texas is that backwater post in the state of Texas. And when we had something crazy happen there, you guys didn't read about it. This is the big city. Little 6,000 person Gladewater doesn't have a whole lot going on, right? Compared to Rome, that's what Jerusalem was. Country, backwater, backwards. You had a guy walking around claiming to be the Messiah. 
Probably got that on some streets in the U.S. today, right? Is that going to be receiving remarks in the newspaper? Probably not. Let me give you one more hostile witness. Some of you may know the name of Bart Ehrman. Uh, he's an agnostic. He was trained under a man named Bruce Metzger. Maybe some of you recognize that name, a very noted New Testament scholar. Has done a, a great deal of work on New Testament manuscripts and documents. Uh, really, really um, accomplished writer and student. Bart Ehrman was trained under him. And Bart Ehrman chose a different path than his instructor. He chose the path of agnosticism. But Bart Ehrman also wrote a book about the historical Jesus. And in a couple of different interviews, as he was publishing that book, he had this to say. He said, I've written an entire book on what Jesus said and did. And for him to say and do anything, he had to exist. I don't think there's any serious historian who doubts the existence of Jesus. This coming from somebody who does not believe in Christianity. This is the hostile witness of hostile witnesses. And he says, of course history attests to the existence of Jesus. He would say this in another YouTube video. As he was speaking to, to an assembled group of people who do not believe in Jesus as a person, but believe that Jesus is simply a myth constructed by, by people and by history. And a lady asked the question in this video, she says, I, I just don't believe there's evidence that Jesus existed. I think he's just a myth. Bart Ehrman responded, let me tell you, once you get outside your conclave, speaking there of the Jesus mythicists, once you get outside of your conclave, this is not even an issue for scholars of antiquity. There is no scholar in any college or university in the Western world who teaches classics, ancient history, New Testament, early Christianity, or any related field who doubts that Jesus existed. The reason for thinking Jesus existed is because he is abundantly attested in the early sources. This isn't a guy who's sitting for gospel preaching on Sunday mornings and partaking of the Lord's Supper. This is a guy who, quite frankly, thinks all of that is foolishness. But he says history affirms that Jesus was real. And so we go back to the beginning. To our YouTube friend who told us there's no historical evidence that Jesus existed. And yet we see account after account after account, even among those hostile to Christianity, that Jesus of Nazareth existed. The historical testimony of Scripture says, yes, he existed. The historical testimony of secular sources say, yes, he existed. And so if Jesus did exist, then number one, I need to reevaluate a lot of voices in the world. One of the absolute drawbacks of social media is now a lot of people have a much louder voice than they would have otherwise. You can find anyone on YouTube who will say whatever you want them to say. But just because somebody says what I like doesn't mean that what they're saying is right. History still has a voice. And to those who would say that Jesus was simply a myth, the voice of history, not Christianity, the voice of history says otherwise. If Jesus did exist, then Scripture needs to be seriously considered. If Jesus existed, here are a group of men who followed with him, who were eyewitnesses of him who spent years with him and who have written their account of their time with him. And that account then is worthy of our consideration. And if Jesus did exist, then I've got to make a decision about Jesus. And I've really got four options here. Jesus was a lunatic. 
He was simply a good man. He was a liar. Or he is Lord. I think we can get rid of lunatic. He doesn't display it, at least in all of the writings that we see, historical or secular and non-secular. There's no indication of mental illness or deficiency there, so we can put that one out. So we're left with three. He's simply a good man, he's a liar, he's a Lord. But option, option two up there, it's option one now, doesn't work. Jesus can't simply be a good man and make the claims that he did. When Jesus claims to be the I am in John eight fifty eight, every Jew who heard him make that claim knew exactly what he was saying. That he was God. Well, the claims that he would make about giving abundant life were the claims he would make about raising the dead or forgiving sin or giving hope. He can't simply be a good man but fail to do what he said. And so that option goes away. And here's what we're left with. Jesus is a liar or Jesus is the Lord and that my friends is the decision we have to make is he a liar or is he just exactly who he claimed to be if he is who he claimed to be that changes absolutely everything and if you believe that he existed and if you believe what he claimed are you willing to act on it are you willing to become his follower are you willing to be united together with him clothed with Christ in baptism living a new life having the hope of the life eternal that he promises and if you're ready to make that confession, if you're ready to respond, we're ready to help you. If you'd let us know by coming while we stand and while we sing.